Proverbs chapter 19. I got to tell you, I, I grappled and grappled and grappled with this for the biggest part of the week. I just didn't know what was going on here. I, I have... I have I've prayed and I've talked to the Lord when, since we started this study, and I, it's pretty easy, or it's easier to tell what Solomon was saying here, but what I've tried to pull out and teach you, and I had to have God to do it, there was no other way to do it, was what was the Holy Spirit saying unbeknownst to Solomon? And that's what we've dug around trying to pull out for our trip through here, and we've tried to make the balance between what Solomon was saying and, and what the Holy Spirit was saying in his pen, okay? Tonight, and, I, and I've always tried to avoid the academic side of it all I could, but tonight we're going to have to resort back to that a little bit because I believe what we're witnessing in this chapter and even part of the last one was an, uh, a paradigm shift or an epiphany. For, for Solomon here, and, and what I mean by that is let's go back and, and discover, let's go back and look at the environment. Let's look at who Solomon is. He's grown up in the, in the Orthodox Jew community. He's grown up in that antiquity Israel for all of his life, and they had certain ideas about things, like the poor were despised and looked down upon. If you wanted to be righteous, that meant the keeping of the law it was a very legalistic mindset. Uh, but I believe what we're going to witness here, if you'll entertain me, is that Solomon has had an epiphany. What he considered to be wealth and prosperity, he is changing his mind here. And we get to witness that. If you're familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes, if you're not, go read it. But I'll, I want to caution you that when you do go read the book of Ecclesiastes, don't, don't stop. Finish it. Because the best part of it is in the, like the last couple of paragraphs of the last chapter. All this is pretty dismal through here. I believe that what we're seeing in the book of Proverbs right now was the making of that. And so let's just begin and, and, and see uh, if you agree. <clears throat> Father, thank you. Your word is a light unto our path and a lamp on our feet. We're seeking the light. We want to understand how to live in wisdom in Christ. And Father, we know that your word can guide us. And we pray that your spirit would help us. As we endeavor to search for you in your word here tonight. And be better people because of it. In Jesus name we pray for your help. Amen. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 1. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity. Than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Uh, up to this point, the poor were looked down upon as if they were despised by God. Well, clearly, they've sinned and made him mad, and his blessing is being withheld from them. And we've seen the flavor of that as we've come through. And I didn't get to go fish up any examples or anything like that, but we've seen the flavor of that in some of these prior chapters. But it seems like that he's flipping the script here. It seems like to me that Solomon is redefining what wealth truly is here. Okay? Because we're talking about, okay, so better, we're familiar with that word. We've seen it before. We've seen it in several places. Better or good, tob, the complete man. Remember the good man, the complete man? Better is the poor. So the poor has now been exalted out of this place of despisement or whatever the word is to use there. I don't know. I may have just made that up. I'm not sure. But he's exalted them out of that place of looking down his nose at them. He's saying they're better. They're better than what? Better than whom, I should say. Better is the 
poor who walks, that means he conducts his daily life uh, in his integrity. Integrity uh, is, it's a good word, uh, but it's not, uh, there's more. You could say better is the poor who walks in his salvation. Because I'm going to tell you what the Hebrew word means. It means several things. It depends on what kind of context you look it up. But the Hebrew word for the translated integrity here, it means, it means wholeness. It means completeness. It means innocence. Innocence in the mind. In other words, I, I, I have good standing with God. I've been justified, if you will. I've been declared not guilty guilty. Uh, it, it, it means uh, safety and security. It also means peace, wholeness, shalom, holiness. All these words declare what God's plan of salvation was for the Jew and the Gentile alike from the beginning. So better is this formerly Look down upon man, this poor man, this man who clearly doesn't have the blessings of God in his life, who walks in his salvation, than one who is perverse or twisted or crooked in his lips and is a fool. We're going to contrast the fool and wisdom a lot in this chapter. We've already been contrasting that. All that could seem a little redundant here. Unless we take a look at Solomon personally and the environment politically and everything. Consider this. I saw Solomon in my imagination when I prayed for this stuck for days and asked God, help me understand. He said, let's go back to what this book actually is. It's Hebrew poetry. Solomon was a wise man. He also fancied himself a philosopher. Hebrew poetry uh, is, is, uses lines of thought and, and, and wisdom and things like this. Instead of rhyme, meter, and musical qualities, it uses lines of thought. It uses parallelisms and contrasts and all kinds of things. So you can almost see Solomon sitting with his chin on his fist on a table just observing the people in his life and applying the wisdom that God gave him and writing his Hebrew poetry. It almost seems sometimes like this is Solomon's diary. That as he was learning and growing in wisdom and in the Lord and all these things, and I know that he did a lot of foolish things, and et cetera. We're going to examine some of that as we go along or refer to it anyway. But it, he, he's, he's writing these chapters, and he's growing as he goes. And that's what we're seeing here. He's had an epiphany. Everything that we believed about judging people was wrong. Wealth isn't defined by money or property or these kind of things. Wealth is defined here by integrity and salvation. Who has believed God? Because he is a wealthy man. Now, better is the poor man who walks in his salvation than the one who is perverse in his lips. In other words, he's a liar and a fool. Now, if we're looking at the environment and he's examining the people as he's thinking about these things, who's the contrast of the poor walking in his salvation? Who's the one who's perverse in his lips? Who's the one who's being foolish by thinking that he can reach God through a religious system? Who's the one who's, per, who's they? because they claimed that they were righteous by the keeping of the law, Ron, but they were lying. Even the Apostle Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews and the tribe of Benjamin and circumcised on the eighth day. He said, man, and he was on his way to being the high priest. And he said, ooh, I've broken every one of them. And I've done it all my life because I didn't realize that I was coveting. Looks good on the outside. 
But this heart, that's what God's interested in. Now, I know I'm hammering this home. I just want to set the stage here. You understand where we're coming from in this? You've got to look at Solomon personally. Okay, verse 2. Also, on top of that, so better is the poor who's walking in his salvation. Also, it's not good for a soul to be without knowledge. And he sins who hastens with his feet. Some of the other translations, if you, if you examine all of them and, and look for it, it says that ze it basically it says zeal without knowledge is good. So don't be, be all enthusiastic if you haven't learned something because you get out here and you'll cause some damage. Hastening with your feet. I've done it. I got this calling. <laughs> I've done it. Hastened with my feet to proclaim something that I hadn't learned and changed my own heart. I hadn't presented myself honestly to God and had my own heart. It's not good for a soul, a person, a human being. You know, when they talk about the number of people, sailors or crew that's on a ship, they say there's 9,000 souls. It's a person. It's a people. The people. Lives. There are lives. It's not good for the life of any human being for that soul to be without knowledge. We need the knowledge of God. We've been skating by. Hitting it with a lick and a promise for years. Now, I'm not saying we need to be more religious. I think Brian was pretty clear this morning out of the book of Ephesians. That our salvation is because of what Jesus did. I'm reminded of Jesus speaking over in John chapter 3. And it's in that famous section of scripture. And it said, uh, whoever doesn't believe in the Son is condemned already. That happened at the garden. We've already examined all that. But I heard a preacher on the radio this week uh, 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 um, emphasize this part. But whoever believes in the Son will not be condemned. I don't know if we believe that. I think that if we believe that, and if we go through here and redefine wealth, what's wealthy, what is important, if we can assign the value that God assigns to the things that He thinks are important, or that He thinks is prosperous, He thinks is wealthy, I think that we would come a lot closer to walking faithfully down this road of sanctification. And discipleship. It's an honor to me. I didn't see it for years. I thought Jesus was trying to get in the way of my drinking. You know, Jesus will mess you drinking up. But it was when I realized the love of God in Christ. I said, I'm following that guy. Save me. I'm not trying to make this about me. What is a wealthy man? What is a wealthy man? I mean, I, I'm not going to go with the David Jeremiah quote again. You've already heard it so many times you're probably sick of hearing it. I'm not going to go with it again. What is a wealthy man? Is it things pertaining to the world? Is it money? Is it, is it okay? So, well, if, if, it's, if it's fancy cars, fancy clothes, I'm out. Although I do have a new shirt. Thanks to my wife. We're going to look at that a little closer in a minute, too. Verse 3, the foolishness of a man twists his way, but his heart frets against the Lord. That strike a familiar chord? It does to me. Why have you forsaken me? It wasn't my fault. I didn't mean to. I didn't ask for this. You made me a drug addict. I'm going to leave that right there. Wealth. <laughs> Wealth. Now, in this case, verse 4. In this case, we're talking about money. The word means it means plenty. It means sufficiency. It means to have enough stuff. Enough. It means plenty. It means money. It means 
financial prosperity. Wealth, that kind of wealth, it makes many friends, but the poor, that we're talking about this guy up here in verse 1 again, the poor, he's separated from his friend. The word means neighbor. He's separated from his neighbor. Now we're talking about the fool. This is his way of thinking. We've got to follow this. That this is the fool's way of thinking. We're going to contrast and go down through here. But, but, but let's remember now, a false witness will not go unpunished. Who's the false witness? The liar. The one who was deceiving the people. The, one who, the ones who were keeping the people separated out from God. The ones who wouldn't let the people come into the presence of God because it didn't suit their need for power and, pr and prominence. And, and to be looked upon. You know who I'm talking about. Right? The religious leaders, we know through our trips through the gospel and all the things, and I'm not, no, look, Solomon's not identifying these guys per se, but it still fits. He's contrasting the difference. He's been raised all of his life to think that these Pharisees, now they're righteous. But now he's looking and he's saying, well, this poor guy over here who's walking in the safety and the security and the peace and the wholeness. And the innocence, he's like Abraham before the law ever came out. He believed God. And now he's a friend of God. That's the guy that I want to follow. The one who has a relationship with God. That's wealthy. A false witness will not go unpunished, verse 5. And he who speaks lies will not escape. You can forget it if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about that. If you're thinking that I can just throw the name of Jesus around loosely and show up at a few church services and be part of the club if I'm counted as one of the attending members and, and that's good enough for me, but I'm not letting Jesus into my heart. Jesus hasn't come into my life. Jesus hasn't got a hold of my life and won't let me go. If, if he's not moved in on the inside. If I'm pretending... The word is hypocrite. We don't want to hear that. It's not sufficient in these last days. It's bearing false witness. You're not lying. Peter told, uh, and, and, uh, what was the name? Sapphira and Ananias and Sapphira. You haven't lied to me. You lied to God. I don't know how many times I've walked out of a church building and I thought, Whew, boy, I got out of that, okay. Well, I'm not fooling anybody. And I'm not insinuating that anybody here, or even anybody watching the broadcast, that anybody in any church, I'm not insinuating that anybody is. I'm simply saying, this is the deception. And if you think you can't be deceived, you already are. God knows our hearts. He knows us on the inside. We need to be redefining what we think is wealth and prosperity into what he thinks is wealth and prosperity because all the money that you might have in savings or all the assets that you might have or the investments that you've made are going to burn. <laughs> many, we're back on this fool again, many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. Boy, that's the flesh all day long. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. And he's begging him. He's like, look, man, I don't want anything from you. I just want to be your friend. Can you just please be my friend? No. No, you're cursed. Because you're poor. Remember that chapter a couple of chapters ago? It said, he who mocks the poor is a disgusting thing to God. That needs to be important. I'm not, 
look, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not stepping on. I'm stepping on my own toes. That's got to be important. That's got to have an important place in my life. I can't get to thinking, well, I got this great job, and I've got everything I need, and I'm doing really well, and so I'm just going to sit over here. I'm going to be like the guy that he said, I'll build myself bigger barns, and I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll do that, and if I despise and mock the poor and look down my nose at them, and I don't do anything to help a brother that's in need, That's not wealth. That's foolishness. It's God's money. Do with it what he says. <laughs> Verse 8. He who gets wisdom, how do you get wisdom? We've gone over it and 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 over it. How do you get wisdom? You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You accept his gift of grace and forgiveness. You start down this road of sanctification, walking down this road of wisdom in discipleship, uh, learning the word under the supervision of the spirit, changing, being renewed in the spirit of the mind. We're submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the written word as we are allegiant to the word that became flesh he who gets wisdom loves his soul we talk, he, Brian taught about it this morning the soul, the difference between the soul the body, the spirit do you love your soul? We've we got a whole culture of people nowadays that are talking about, well, you just need to love yourself. You just need to help yourself. You need to take, out for, take up for yourself. You need to look out for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. You need to have self-esteem. You need to be this. You need to make sure that you're okay. Everybody's looking out for number one. Go sit in a truck stop parking lot for a day if you want some real quality entertainment. Who needs cable vision? Go I sat in Sulphur Springs, Texas and watch everybody who was promoting themselves and looking out for number one and it was like a demolition derby out there almost insanity no respect no common decency me and another old guy and I, I kind of hate to it kind of makes me throw up in my mouth a little bit to realize that I'm one of the old guys now but me and the old guy sitting next to me were watching once in a while he'd lean up and look at me and go it's insanity If you really love your soul, you'll start on a journey of faith and belief, and you'll get the wisdom and the riches that are in Christ Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, the, the, what the poor man who walked in his integrity, the safety, the peace, the the wholeness, the innocence with God, the justification, the wisdom, the intelligence, everything that comes in the Spirit. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. And he who keeps understanding that's knowledge of the Holy One, he'll find good. I almost interrupted you this morning, Brian, when you were teaching, when you were talking about, when you were talking about worrying about the things of the world. And but C.S. Lewis said, "Aim towards heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim towards earth, you'll get nothing." He who gets wisdom loves his soul, and he who keeps understanding. That means it's a precious thing. I'm holding, I've buried it into the deep places of my heart. Understanding. Knowledge of the Holy One. Jesus. A relationship with Him. When I bury that treasure deep in my heart, I won't let it go. Who was it that said, buy wisdom and don't sell it. Hang on to it. Then I find good no matter what's going on. In the world around me. Paul said. <laughs> I've been in rags. And I've been wealthy. I've been full. And I've been hungry. But I have learned. Learned. 
how to be content in whatever state I'm in. When we are one with Jesus, I've been broke and I've been in trouble and I've had problems and I've had friends that came to bail me out in this last few years. I've had friends to help me. And if it wasn't for y'all, I'd have had a lot worse problems than I did. But you know what? I've learned how to be content. I've had God bless me with abundance and I've had him dry the well up. And I've learned to say, okay, all right. I know you're a good, good father. What are you trying to teach me? I believe it's similar to what Solomon is learning right here in this thing. Is that everything that we've been taught about what's wealth and prosperity is a little off. If we aim toward heaven, we get that stuff thrown in. But it requires wisdom to have the right attitude and to learn how to be content. And if you get wisdom, you love your own soul. A false witness, verse 9, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. Now, all you Christians that's in here today, if y'all have told a lie, I'm sorry, but you're going to hell. Is that what this is saying? Jesus said what's whispered in the secret places will be shouted from the rooftops. There's no condemnation in Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you should be a liar. We're supposed to love the truth. We're supposed to be in a relationship with the truth. We're supposed to be in a marriage with the truth. Jesus said, I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the way. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. We learn that way on this road of wisdom and discipleship. We learn to love the truth because the truth is in us. But don't get to thinking that the lies won't be exposed. You think you're slick. I'm telling you what I know. It'll be shouted from the rooftops. We can't hide from God. The parish here, it's speaking of a spiritual death. These, we've got to be honest with God honest with ourselves because it's in truth that our relationship is anchored. 10. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. The discretion, 11, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger and his glory is to overlook a transgression. We're talking about forgiveness. I'm sorry. I got hot. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger. And his glory is to overlook a transgression. You could apply that. You could stick that right off in that package deal with wisdom. When we get wisdom, there's a process. This thing happens slowly. We get closer to being slow to anger at least I hope I'm telling you right because it's still in front of me to get but I'm slower to anger than I used to be anybody slower to anger than they was when they first came to Jesus this is a process and we've got to stay faithful in the process because we're still in the flesh Paul said the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who gave himself for me my faith my confidence is in him and his ability he said being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you Glenn David will complete it until the day of Christ 
And I believe that. But we're not there yet. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion. But his favor is like dew on the grass. Now, the king is not capitalized, so I'm assuming he was talking about either himself or his daddy. A foolish son, Judy, this is the part that you was telling your story out there the day. I, that's why I was asking, did you read this already? <laughs> A foolish son is the ruin of his father. And the contentions, okay women, brace yourself. The contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. How many naggers we got in the house? Liars. <laughs> okay, let's catch the contrast, okay? Because we're going somewhere different than what you imagine. A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. Verse 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, little f fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, I'm going to say that out of a thousand women, Solomon knows what he's talking about here. I'm sure he had some naggers in the house, and I'm sure he had a couple of prudent women here. But since we're redefining wealth here, since we're redefining prosperity here, now he's not saying, now the naggers I don't like, but these are... How many of you men would love to have a prudent wife? She's from the Lord. She's part of that wealth that we're redefining. Let's go back up into chapter 18. I skipped over this last Sunday night, but, but let's go back over there. It's uh, verse 22 in chapter 18. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. How many of you can stretch your imagination? Okay, let me say this. How, Glenn David, can you stretch your imagination to understand that the way that you've always viewed wealth is a little skewed and that your wife is from the Lord? Lord, and that when you found her, you found a good thing. And that makes you a wealthy man. And if you don't want her to be the contentious woman that's like a continual dripping, then you're not off the hook here, boy. I'm putting this all on my shoulders. If I want that prudent wife, you know what I got to do? I got to be one myself because the two of us are one. And I'm the bride of Jesus Christ. And she is a gift from God for me. And I have obtained the favor of the Lord. And it's about high time that I start seeing her with the value that she deserves because God gave her to me and she's part of me. And if I want us to be the prudent wife to Jesus, then I got to do my part. And that begins with a paradigm shift and an attitude change. That's what God's been doing in my heart. She makes me a wealthy man. She's one of several things since Jesus got a hold of my life and won't let me go that makes me a very wealthy Man, now I'm not talking about that I got a big fat bank account and a big long Cadillac. I don't have that stuff. And I wear clothes to work from Walmart. But I, <laughs> friends, because of Jesus Christ, am a wealthy man. And he's changing my heart and my attitude and my paradigm shift to realize that she is one of the most glorious things that God has given me. And I haven't viewed it like that. And I'm sorry. It's amazing how you rock on for so many years and have so much trouble so many problems. The restoring power of God to do it right in front of a man's eyes and 
I didn't have a cotton-picking thing to do with it. I had as much involvement in him restoring our marriage as I did my own salvation. He who obtains a he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And she may be the contentious woman once in a while, but I'm the contentious woman nagging over there in the corner in my bad mood having self in the afternoons. If you know me, you know me, right? It's up growling and growling, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm a nagger myself. Nobody's off the hook here. But what we've got to do is forgive each other. It wasn't optional. If we could just see. I'm going back to your Ephesians study, Brian. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you could see. See the riches, the wealth that God has given us lousy human beings on this earth and quit counting it in terms of money. I feel like I'm having an out-of-body experience here and the Holy Spirit's standing right in front of me. I'm screaming at myself. All right, verse 15. We're going to wrap it up here pretty soon. I'll finish the, let's see, 29 verses. Let's quit right there. Let's just quit right there. And I'll get this last half of that next Sunday night. And we, it, it's kind of following a little bit of, a, we're, we're, we're moving into a little bit of a different thing. And besides that, that's a great place to leave for us men. You know, it's not just the women in the church who are the bride of Christ. We need to take some responsibility, men. We think it, it's all supposed to go our way. But my Bible tells me that I need to love her like Christ loves the church. And he didn't he never stood there and said, Well, okay, you get your act together. <laughs> Because I was a mess when he began loving me. I, I, I would just leave it right there. Ron's sitting on G, waiting on O. <laughs> I hope something out of this stuff. <laughs> I hope something out of this stuff helped you a little bit tonight or encouraged you a little bit tonight or was a blessing to you here tonight. I know that it has been for me. If nothing else, he got through my thick skull in this chapter to help me see the value of what he's given me. And I hope it's done the same thing for you. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, Lord. We wouldn't be able to love you except that you poured your love into us. How great is our God uh, that he would give himself for a bunch of sinners. Stick it out with us. David said in the Psalms, Lord, he said, who, who, who is man that you're mindful of him? We agree with that testament, Lord. We don't know. We know we haven't done anything to deserve your love. But gosh, we're sure, we're, God, we're sure thankful for it. Lord, we're sure thankful for your love. We worship you here tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our family here. Thank you that you're mindful of us and that you tend to us and that you're patient and tolerant with us and that you don't give up on us and you help us each and every day. Thank you for that, Lord, and show us the way. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.